is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Unspoiled, the book club covering Sharp Objects by Gillian Flynn. In this book, a really unusually fucked up and dysfunctional family is caught in the middle of a murder investigation. And it turns out everybody's a murderer. Welcome (laughs) to Unspoiled. <laughs> yeah. That's that's kind of fair. <laughs> Welcome to the show everybody. I am Natasha. I am this book club's co-host Rashawn. <laughs> I was just here last time for the Wisher. That's true. And here I am again. I know you guys are sick of me. Yeah, I'm sure everybody's so mad that you're co-hosting, <laughs> co-hosting twice with me. <laughs> um so yeah, this book, y'all, first of all, uh I listened to it on audiobook. I like to let people know ahead of time if that is the way that I experienced it. And uh, the audiobook I thought was performed really well. I did too. I really I liked too. it. And it was I just the one woman, but she did really well. Yeah, I it was not like a full cast thing, but um, I tend to dislike full cast, to be honest. I've noticed people hmm. will often be like, oh, yeah, it's a full cast. Like it's a real plus. And for me, that interrupts the rhythm of things a lot Um, this is probably the only the second or third audiobook fiction that i've ever listened to wow Um, the all all my credits i had i use on Mm nonfiction, which is fine if it's just one person but um i liked American Gods, and it was a full cast, and it's probably my favorite non uh, fiction book that I've listened to on Audible. Okay. Um, I need to be able to be clear about who is speaking, you know, mm-hmm. um, and and whose perspective we're getting, and I have trouble with that when it's just a single narrator. Gotcha. But I thought this woman did an excellent job. Yeah, it probably does depend on the book also, like, you know, for something like The Dresden Files, everything's from Harry's POV, so it really Mm -hmm. isn't that difficult, but he still does an amazing job with the voices. Um, But yeah, American Gods is actually one that I had a little bit of a hard time getting into, so I just think that in general, it's not for me a lot of the Mm -hmm. time. Um, But you found this book by accident, right? I did. It was in the lobby of my apartment building. Oh, wow. um, For some reason, I thought it was like in your work break room i didn't realize it was your apartment building okay or it might i think you might be right maybe it was because the old job in the break room they had like a little mini library where people were encouraged to bring books to leave if they didn't want them anymore and that you're right that is exactly where i got it i got it at work um and i had not read or seen girl gone girl yet when i found this book so i wasn't familiar with her work at all and i just tore through the book i was done in like two and a half three days if if that long yeah i mean my my listening to the audiobook took me two and a half days i think mm. um it was i think an eight and a half hour nine hour audiobook and i just like started it one evening out on a walk and like could not stop listening to it every spare mm-hmm. second i had um and gone girl i loved that book it's very trashy in its way like it's a very mm-hmm. pop boilery type of story um but it's so much fun because of how over the top it is that mm-hmm. that's fine and i sort of went into this book expecting a similar thing and it's a much more like grounded examination of a character mm-hmm. in a way that i was not prepared for it's it's just much more serious and god um, yes it's it's still kind of pop boilery like the plots but in it, it feels so much more true to life and so much weird like despite it being an a completely bombastic story really like 
the stuff of tabloids when you look at it at the end Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the moment there is so much about it that is immediately relatable in small ways and it was just the kind of thing that like gets in your head yeah the themes in this book which are mothers and daughters Mm -hmm. you know is always going to be rife for you know exploration and um me personally getting me like right in the gut um, and the relationships of all the, cause it's, it's, the book is 98% female driven, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. There's the one, there's the two cops, there's the, the big brother, and then there's the stepdad who is not even like a really fully formed character. No. And I don't mean that as a slight, I mean that his actual existence doesn't seem to be fully formed and yes. that really comes across in the book. Um, and it's just all these relationships women have with each other, with our daughters, with our mothers, with our girlfriends, with our rivals. Um, and I thought in a lot of ways it was really true. I mean, it was, it was ratcheted up, you know, for, Mm -hmm. for effect because, you know, you're reading something you want to be entertained, but I don't feel like she was making shit up, you know? You know, all of it felt really grounded in truth. And it's, that's a bummer because these relationships were terrible. Oh my God. They're toxic with a capital T. Mm-hmm. Cap- with all caps toxic. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, first thing I want to just talk about is overall the way the story is told. Because... This is a book that really takes its time and even Mm. letting you know who the main character is that you're reading from their POV, Camille, Mm -hmm. um, it's not until at least a third of the way in that you begin to find out what her childhood was like, what went on with her sister, and the fact that she is a cutter. Mm -hmm. And... There are hints about the cutting and the nature of it because she frequently is like scribbling one word over and over on a pad or mm-hmm. she wrote a single word on the inside of her forearm or on the back of her hand or she will like focus on one word in a sentence and just kind of repeat it over and over like a mantra in her head. Mm-hmm. There is this obsessiveness when it comes to the words that I really couldn't put my finger on when I started reading it. I was like... This is clearly a thing, but I don't know what this means. Like, what is right. this? And it's so, we're so far into her story by the time we find out what's happening there. Um, yeah. There's a um, description after we get the reveal that she's a cutter when she talks about being a kid in the almost OCD level uh, fixation she had on words mm-hmm. and how for her words would seem like they would just hang in the air and she needed to like grab them. Yeah. Um, before they escaped. And, um, I just, I mean, I don't really know that much about cutting. Um, I don't know if I have encountered any characters and any, anything I've consumed that were cutters. So I don't know if people think that this is accurate or true to life, Mm -hmm. but I thought her description of it was, breathtaking seems like the wrong word but it's the word i want to use you know? yeah um i actually have that that paragraph so i'm going to read this so that you guys get a because it's so like danced around and then when it, she finally talks about it it's like this bald sort of language um i am a cutter you see also a snipper a slicer a carver a jabber i am a very special case i have a purpose My skin, you see, screams. It's covered with words. Cook, cupcake, kitty, curls. As if a knife-wielding first grader learned to write on my flesh. I sometimes, but only sometimes, laugh. Getting out of the bath and seeing out of the corner of my eye down the side of a leg, baby doll. Pull on a sweater and in a flash of my wrist, harmful. Why these words? Thousands of hours of therapy have yielded a few ideas from the good doctors. They are often feminine in a Dick and Jane pink versus puppy dog tales sort of way, or they're flat out negative. 
Number of synonyms for anxious carved on my skin. Eleven. The one thing I know for sure is that at the time, it was crucial to see these letters on me, and not just see them, but feel them. Burning on my left hip, petticoat. And near it, my first word slashed on an anxious summer day at age 13. Wicked. I woke up that morning, hot and bored, worried about the hours ahead. How do you keep safe when your whole day is as wide and empty as the sky? Anything could happen. I remember feeling that word heavy and slightly sticky across my pubic bone. My mother's steak knife, cutting like a child along red imaginary lines, cleaning myself, digging in deeper, cleaning myself, pouring bleach over the night and sneak over the knife and sneaking it through the kitchen to return it. Wicked relief. The rest of the day, I spent ministering to my wound, digging into the curves of the W with an alcohol-soaked Q-tip, petted my cheek until the sting went away. Lotion, bandage, repeat. Hmm. Yeah. Like, so, yeah. <laughs> you're listening to this on the audiobook, not ready that this is coming, and I'm just, I remember I was in my kitchen as this started, and I was just like, I stopped, and just like, let her finish the paragraph i was just like what like yeah. as it sank in what she was actually saying and that happens like what page is that on are you looking at it electronically so you can't see yeah but, but um, um yeah, like you said it does take a little while into the story before we find that out about her mm-hmm. um there is mention about how she dresses early in in the book you know always with the long sleeves and covering up you know her wrist and all that stuff but we don't know what's happening underneath her clothes, like, until until that moment. And she's pretty fucked up. This is a character. Yeah. Before we find out about the cutting, this is a... We know that she has um, some type of psychiatric malady, right? Mm-hmm. Because we know that she has been hospitalized. Mm-hmm. But we don't know exactly what for. Right. Um, and we, and she's drinking, she's definitely got a drinking problem. Mm -hmm. Um, and I want to say we even hear the story about what happened to her one way when she's 13 and then we come back later and it comes up again, but she tells it a little bit differently. Um, are you talking about the, the sex with all the football players Mm -hmm, thing mm -hmm. the first time we hear about it she's telling it as if it happened to somebody else to the cop Mm -hmm. and she tells us about her first kiss in the woods when she was 13 Mm -hmm. with uh, a football player who has like a wad of chew in his mouth but we don't find out later that that's the same moment in her life where she gets passed around Mm -hmm. um so yeah, the book, it, the story gives us these little hints all the way through, mm-hmm. um, and it just builds up to such a tension. Yeah. By the end of the book, I was just like, "All right, who fucking did it? <laughs> <laughs> who did you think? Did you, I? I thought it was the mom. I. All right, so uh, it's so annoying because I hate being this person, but I thought it was the daughter almost immediately Mm -hmm. because of the setup of her coming to the town. And this is such a stupid, like I get really mad because uh, I feel like I ruin it for myself, but also there are patterns to the way a lot of people tell these stories. And I don't even mean like just, just in general, like mysteries, there are some tropes I feel like that I always zero in on and I hope that I'm wrong because I don't want it to have been that simple. Mm-hmm. And it's makes it sound like when I say it this way that it ruined the book for me and it didn't. I had an idea that it was her, but it didn't change the way I felt about learning slowly who it was. Right. Um but yeah, when she arrives to at the town after being assigned to cover this uh this murder it's one murder when she arrives at the town and they don't find the body of the other girl until she's been there like for a day. Um, she runs, she's going into the woods to find all of the townspeople who are in what? I thought that the first murder had already happened. Yeah. That's what I just said. There's one murder when she heads down there and they find the second body. 
after she's been there for a day. There's one murder that happened like a year earlier. Right. Okay. The, the girl is just missing when she comes there. Right. Right. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So she goes into the woods because everybody's missing in town and she finally like stops somewhere, a gas station or someplace. And they're saying that, um, or maybe she goes to the actual police station and they say that everybody's out looking for this little girl and they give her directions to like where in the woods, the sort of like head of the trail is. And they have, uh, that is where Ama is sitting with her three friends and acting really like callous about the whole thing. And she doesn't know it's Ama. She doesn't recognize mm-hmm. her right away. Right. And we had heard about her, you know, little half sister that she didn't connect with. And her description of seeing Ama the first time was like, well, there was something very familiar about her. And she was clearly very young, but had the body of a woman. And I was like, okay, so this is probably her little half sister that she doesn't recognize. And the weirdness of how they were sitting there completely separate from the search itself and not apparently concerned. Mm-hmm. That made me go, these fucking bitches are in on this somehow. Son, <laughs> these girls is wrong. Like, <laughs> And as I read, I started to reconsider and think maybe it was the mom. I feel like it was the mom. But I don't like there's something wrong with this little girl. There's clearly something up with her. And I can't shake that it was her or that her and the mom did it together. When I was reading it, I, um, I thought it was the mom. Then as I got more into the book, I started to consider Ama as the, as the murderer, but I could not, I think as a, as like personally, I could not imagine that that's how this book was going to go. Mm-hmm. Like I found myself being like, there's no way that they're going to say it was the little girls. Yeah. Like they're just not, they're not going to do that. So then it became like, all right, it's got to be the mom then. And that's part of my just wanting it to not be a little girl who's responsible for these two murders. And also me not thinking that this author is going to have the balls to make yeah. it the little girl, you know? I think that's sort of where I was also like after I first met them and I was like, they did it. And then I was like, is this the, that kind of book though? And mm. it wasn't until later when she's like talking to the cop about all of the horrible shit that's happened in this town mm-hmm. that I was like, okay, this book is dealing very upfront with the themes of how small town life can be really toxic, mm-hmm. how young people can be incredibly cruel how our standards for like what is okay for how women act are like so jacked up that it leads to like really fucked up punishments like social Mm -hmm. punishments and so that was what led me to start to be like maybe that is okay maybe i was right maybe that is what she's doing because the conversation with and I'm trying to remember what the cop's name is. Richard. Richard Willis. Willis. He um that is the most revealing conversation for me in the book in terms of what like me feeling like by once I read them talking with each other about this and how different his perspective was and how she had normalized so much of this that him being incredulous over some things she was saying mm. were was like really she didn't understand why he was reacting the way that he was. Are I you, felt like that the, gave me the realest sense of who she was. Which know? conversation? The one where she t- conv- tells him that she was the one in the woods with the football players, or no? Earlier? It's Which- the earlier one when they first go to the bar, and he's just asking, like for her to tell him some stories about things that have happened here because he wants to get a sense of what kind of history this town has and how they cope with violence. All right. So she talks about a mother biting her child. Um, and And she doesn't tell him who it is, right? No, but, uh, how about that? Mm. Uh, yeah. Mm. And then the, um, the rape and the, the whole, like, weird defensiveness when he says it's rape and Mm -hmm. she's like but was it and he's like are you high of course it fucking she was a child what are you talking about and then she does this whole thing where she's like well i find it 
really condescending and offensive mm-hmm. that we behave mm-hmm. as if women need to be babysat. And I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. You have, you are messed up, girl. Like, obviously. And that, for, that like, because I was having a trouble, like, getting a, a, a bead on her, you know? Mm-hmm. And once you get there and you see how much she's lying to him and then how much she's clearly lying to herself. Right. And you get the weird, like, third person telling of things that happened to her that she's, like, distancing herself from. I was like, oh, God, this is really bad. It's so much worse than I thought. <laughs> um, when the book opens, you know, she is being asked to go back to her hometown to cover the story of missing girls. And she doesn't want to go. Mm-hmm. Um, but her editor, Curry is clearly thinking this would be good for her, that she Mm -hmm. needs a good story. He's probably also, because he's completely unaware of what her deal was, what she comes from. Right. So there was probably a part of him that thought that maybe going home to be with your family would be helpful in some way. Mm Mm-hmm. And she knows this is going to be bad for her. Mm Mm-hmm. But she goes anyway. Um... And if I remember correctly, she's like drinking before she even gets into town. Yeah. Um, And then finally she, you know, I think she stops at a bar and then she shows up at her mom's house and we meet Adora for the first time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel like I know women like her. Um, And (sighs) it is like that, that, um, overemphasis on being polite Mm -hmm. and behaving appropriately Mm -hmm. and it's funny because we were talking last night in harry potter about weaponizing femininity Mm -hmm. and my god is adora a master at that yeah she is adora is like and i found it really telling that as camille's heading down there she stops and gets a hotel room when she's 30 minutes outside of town Mm -hmm. like she's almost there and she still needs to, like, keep a barrier up as long yeah. as she can possibly make it happen. Um, and doesn't tell her mother that she's coming. Nope. She just shows up. Which is a really weird tactic to me when you are, when you're not on good terms with somebody and you are kind of worried about how they're going to react to things. To not give them a heads up, it's almost like she's trying to force her mother into revealing herself. Yeah. I wasn't sure if that was like, if she did that almost like out of spite Mm -hmm. on some level. Yeah. Because she knows that it would make her mom really upset and she wants to hurt her mom. Yeah. Or if it was knowing that if she talked to her mom on the phone, there's no way she would be able to go down there. You know, maybe like that's just have it. Yeah. You know, having any kind of contact prior to her arrival, she would just shut down. And she wants to, I guess, not, she wants to be able to pull through and make this story happen because she respects her editor and she loves him and she doesn't want to disappoint him. Mm hmm. Um, ugh, Adora. <laughs> yeah. It, so she shows up and her mother is, you know, myth that she would just pop up out of the blue. Mm-hmm. But, you know, what is she going to do? And she welcomes her in and then the whole thing starts. And it's just, it's weird from the jump. Yeah. The way her mother treats her. It's, it's so clear it, she doesn't like her. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they clearly don't like each other. Her mother, it, it's like she doesn't. She's reacting the way she does to her mother, though, because of the way her mother treats her. Mm-hmm. It's not like the, it's it's there are different types of like resentments that you can feel towards your parents and you can really love your parent and they can really love you and you still have that, you know, mm-hmm. but this is a very specific thing where even as a child, she always could tell that her mother did not care about her. Mm -hmm. And so she has developed this combo of like resentment and coldness toward her mother while also desperately still wanting that approval. Yeah. She wants not just the approval, but she wants the connection and the Mm -hmm. comfort that a mother is supposed to provide, you know, Mm -hmm. later in the book, when she starts to tell us about Marion dying and how Adora 
locks herself up in her bedroom in mor- in mourning for you know mm-hmm. months at a time, and Camille is not allowed inside the bedroom. Right, like that is. Can you? Im- I mean, yeah, I, that's so bizarre. Yeah, you know, um, and did you suspect that? I suspected the the adore killed Marion like pretty early on. Right. Yeah, and and my immediate suspicion that Adora killed Marion was what shook my my solidity on thinking that Ama was the one who killed the little girls, because I didn't think that there were going to be two different murderers. Mm, like, why right. would you think that? Why would you, know? you think that? So as soon as I started to be like, well, Marion, like she definitely some something was funky with that, and I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure that she killed either she killed her outright or she did something to prevent her from getting better um Mm. were my two theories that like she was legitimately sick and then her mother like kept her sick but yeah the fact that we both immediately were like yeah this woman definitely killed her Mm. daughter and it's a a real testament to this writing i think you know yeah i i feel like i got the sense it almost feels like it came from camille herself you know, it's like Camille already knew on some level what mm-hmm. her mother had done, right? And it was just percolating under the surface. Yeah. And um, it somehow, when reading the book, it felt almost like the doubts that were in Camille's head made it to my head. Where, you know, you're just like, oh, this is something's not right with this woman. What did she do to that little girl, you know? Yeah. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So what it like to jump ahead on on dealing with with uh, Adora and her whole deal? Um, it turns out that she has been chosen by proxy, and that she really enjoyed not only the attention that she got from everyone else via having a sick daughter and then a daughter who passed away, but she got off on the adoration of the, her sick daughter mm-hmm. being who, needed. Yeah, like being needed, you take such good care of me, mama, mm-hmm. like the whole weird connection that yeah. comes from constantly caring for a child who is mm-hmm. totally dependent on you. And I found it really interesting that there is a scene later where she talks about how it was no good trying that with Camille because Marion became pliant and mm-hmm. and dependent when she was sick and Camille grew angry. Yep. And that was not what she was looking for. So she just moved on yeah. to her sister. One of the things she, she hurls at Camille an accusation is that you never needed me. Mm-hmm. You know, um, how dare you exist and not fulfill my needs. Um, right. And she really did just later at the end, of, the very, very end of the book, after everything comes out, there's like two excerpts from Adora's diary. Yeah. And she writes that uh, she thinks it'd be better to focus her full attention on Marion. Right. You know? um, mm-hmm. And it was dated like something ridiculous, like 84, when Camille would have been like, you know, 11 years old or something. Yeah. Um, I don't know what kind of mother does that. <laughs> um, and we find out that Adora's mother. So now we're talking like, intergenerational right trauma right because Adora, Adora's mother what's her name Joya God is it what weird names everybody has in this yeah um was also terrible and they don't come out and say it but at one point when Camille is talking to Jackie she says that Adora was always sick when she was a kid yeah so oh and that scene yeah. about peeling off the sunburn Oh, yeah, and she eventually, we find out, left her in the woods. Mm Mm-hmm. Left her in the woods, and then um, Adora was able to make her way home, and Joya, like, just looks up from her paper and then goes back to reading. What do you think that's about? Like, because that does not seem like Munchausen by proxy with her mom. It's something else was happening there. That sounded, that felt to me like a... Don't ever forget, I can just leave you anywhere. Like, you know, I am okay. like a show of power. Um, yeah. 
Because if she wanted to harm her, she could have just, like, bashed her head in with a log while they were in the middle of the woods. She doesn't put a right. finger on her. She just leads her into the woods and leaves her there. And takes her shoes. Oh, that's right. She takes her shoes. That's the part that, like, you know, it's bad enough to leave your kid, but to do that so that you're, like, physically weakening them, it's just mm-hmm. the whole thing is so messed up. And and it's always tempting for me to, like, hear stories like this in books and especially in fiction and try and distance that from reality and be like, wow, well, this is quite a story. But the more people you meet who open up and tell you stuff, the more mm-hmm. you find out that weirdo, fucked up, damaging shit like this is super common. Mm-hmm. And people just don't share it because what are you going to say? Yeah, yeah. What response is anybody going <laughs> to have if you tell them that this happened to you? You know, like... Um, And Adora is wealthy because she owns, like, this huge slaughterhouse. Mm-hmm. Which... There were, I like, the descriptions of the slaughterhouse are really upsetting. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it, like, made me go to Google and I started to type in, is Jillian Flynn, and it finished vegetarian, <laughs> question mark, vegan, question mark. Because <laughs> apparently everybody was thinking the same thing. It's like, wow, she is really painting an ugly picture of this. Is mm-hmm. this because she, like, has her own agenda? Or where is this coming from? I you mean, know? if you have ever, I've never seen a slaughterhouse thank god Mm -mm. um there were pig farmers when i lived in georgia um and there's a moment where she's describing the smell and i'm like that is fucking dead on because you can smell a pig farm for miles yeah it's just but um when i think the whole thing she does with making wind gap like a character in the book Mm -hmm. you know it really does feel like this town has its almost like its own personality you know yeah. it is as much a character in the book as any of them the way she paints this town the bleakness of it mm-hmm. the um because her parents no adora's parents bring the pig industry the slaughterhouse into town right and don't they they both die remember Adora gets knocked up when she's 17. Right, yeah. And, and we never par- find out who Camille's dad is. Like, that's nope. not even a factor in the story. Nope. nope. And she's she's never told Camille, so Camille can't relate in the story, and it never comes out. And both her parents, I think her both her parents were dead within a year after she had the baby. Mm-hmm. Which is, I mean, I could start thinking some shit, but I don't know if that's, like, part of it or not. <laughs> I mean, it feels right to me that, you know, she wants people who need her and care about her. And that's not them. When she has the conversation with Camille and Jackie and Jackie is saying how, how furious Joya was because Adora managed to go and have something and do something that like was outside of her control. Right. Um, That whole conversation with Jackie later in the book is fascinating. Yeah. But that doesn't happen till later. So she's in town and she's trying to get information and nobody will really talk to her. The chief mm-hmm. police, Vickery, it's not giving her any information. And she's just wandering around this town that she's from, but feeling like a complete outsider. And she's mm-hmm. hammered almost all the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, Emma. That's a lot happening there. Yeah. This little girl is brilliant and manipulative, conniving, and just awful, but also has these moments where she's so vulnerable. Mm hmm. And um, it's like practice vulnerability. You know, it's. It- it is, but at the same time, I think it is genuine. It's just that she doesn't know how to, like, be. So everything comes across as really stilted Mm -hmm. in a way, because I feel like she just doesn't understand how to like be a person. Yeah. She's a performer. She's learned to perform for her mother and be what her mother needs her to be. And then she goes out into the world when her mom's not looking and she's this seemingly completely different person, this Mm -hmm. cruel and hateful 
And when Camille asked her why, you know, why are you like this? Mm-hmm. And she just says, you know, I, I don't know. I yeah, because Camille has one moment with her where Alma comes into her room and is talking to her about their mom and is being kind of like, you know, and she brings her a joint mm-hmm. and is like, I see that you drink all the time and that's way worse for you. And I'm trying to be nice here. Like Alma's mm-hmm. like weirdly reaching out in her fucked up way. The only way that she knows how. And then the next day, Camille sees her at somebody's house and Alma's being horrible yeah and she says you were so nice to me last night why are you like this right now and ama says i don't know i wish i did i wish i could change it but i can't and i don't know Mm -hmm. and i found that to be such a uh like genuine moment because ama's described as looking a little concerned and and sad when she answers her like Mm -hmm. she really doesn't understand why she's like this Yep. And having that awareness at, at that age has to be like really alarming, you know. I mean, she's um, Alma's what thirteen in, in this book, I think. Yeah, I think so. And that's a tough age, anyway. Like mm-hmm. under the very best of circumstances, but she is living in this house of horrors with this right. uh, with Adora, and where. Remember the line she says to Camille about how um, Camille is lecturing her about how she's how she caught her behaving with boys. And she says something like, you, you shouldn't let them do that to you. Yes. And Emma says, sometimes when you let people do stuff to you, you're really doing stuff to them. Mm-hmm. Which, good God, girl, you're 13. What are right? you doing knowing that? Like, what? And it's a really beautiful character moment as well. Because... Ama and Camille are both in many ways dealing. They both have had to deal with the exact same issues as the other. Mm-hmm. They were both raised by the same woman, put through the ringer in many of the same ways, mm-hmm. living in the same podunk bullshit town and being mm-hmm. held to the same absurd standards. Yep. And yet the way they're each dealing with it is so different from yep. one another. It's um, both living in the shadow of this dead sister. that's mm-hmm. like going to be perfect forever because she's dead now. Mm-hmm. Um, I love too. Emma becomes interested in Camille when she sees the cuts. Right, that's when yeah. Camille becomes something that's worth paying attention to, mm-hmm. um, which is also really startling because it—I don't know—it speaks to something dark in Emma. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I oh found my God. it. Here it is. Uh, pull it. Sometimes if you let people do things to you, you're really doing it to them, Amma said, pulling another blow pop from her pocket. Cherry. Know what I mean? If someone wants to do fucked up things to you and you let them, you're making them more fucked up. Then you have the control, as long as you don't go crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that is clearly how Amma feels like she's handling her mother. Um, yeah, and but handling everybody in the whole town, you know, um, we can talk about the power she has over those three girls, um, Kelsey, Jodes, I forget the third one's name. Yeah, I can't remember either. Um, but and I like to how notorious Abba is, but people can't really speak out against her publicly or mm-hmm. in mixed company because she's Adora's daughter and Adora holds such a like at the top of the food chain in this little town. Yeah. You know? um, none of the women want to risk falling out with her. They don't want to be excluded or ostracized. And but, but everybody knows Emma is terrible. Yeah. You know, and the minute that they have a moment where they can speak frankly with Camille they fucking are like, yo, you know, about you know she's sister. the devil, right? <laughs> yeah. And I love how initially all Camille does is be like, well, I haven't been here in a long time. So, mm-hmm. you know, her better than me. Like she mm-hmm. just keeps trying to, even though all you've seen from the moment you got here is that they are all correct. Like, right. right. But she just doesn't basically just doesn't want to get involved if she can avoid it, which good yeah. luck. 
And that's the thing, too. The longer she's in this town, the more involved she ends up becoming Mm -hmm. in these... I don't want to say in their lives overall, but just because she makes a point to tell us a couple times in the story how the people in Wind Gap won't give you anything unless they feel like you're playing along with with the right. rules of the town on mm-hmm. um that that bizarre night she gets invited to the house with all the girls she went to high school with so weird right it, it turns it's like it's supposed to be like a fun night like with wine and i don't know movies or whatever mm-hmm. and then it turns into each woman basically just falling apart about how unhappy they are about whatever it is one woman wants to have more kids and her husband won't let her and you know one i don't know whatever they're each thing they all start falling apart right and then they all turn on camille yeah because women can be really terrible and cruel and mean and And they all like they turn on her in that very specific way that people who have followed a mapped plan of what you are supposed to do as you grow up Mm -hmm. do on somebody who has not followed that plan. This is something that I have experienced secondhand. I have seen it happen to friends. I have, I have enough force to my personality that people don't do this with me really. Um, Because I think that they are quite aware. I am not going to, tolerate anybody saying this shit to me Mm -hmm. but i have friends who really want to keep their their other friends even though they don't seem to like them and i don't understand that (laughs) and i'll i have seen them be targeted this way by women who are like well i just don't think that if you've never had a child you can Mm -hmm. even really understand what love is yeah Yeah. that kind of thing and it's just the whole way that it goes with all of them trying to tell her that she doesn't know what happiness is, even though they all just got done talking about how unhappy they mm-hmm. are. Mm-hmm. It's really well done. And the ramp up to it is really excellent. Yeah. I feel like because she doesn't want to go, but she agrees because she's sort of like on the one hand, there's a story and she's hoping mm-hmm. to like find something out. And on the other hand, she's just like, this will be fucking weird. All right. Mm-hmm. I guess <laughs> like, and there's a, a girl there who <clears throat> is new to town and th- her and that other girl go to the kitchen to t- sort of like get away from the situation when somebody starts losing it because they don't know the woman who's mm-hmm. breaking down and they sort of want to give her her privacy in a way. And they get to talking about something completely else while they're in that room and are laughing amongst the two of them. Yep. And the other woman, they've started talking about the murder while they're out there. And so she comes in and sees them laughing and is like, oh, it's really nice to see that you guys can giggle it up while we're over here worrying about our children being killed. Yep. And just the way, like, everything feels like a trap. It was. It absolutely felt like a trap. Yeah. And the woman she's had been giggling with, once they rejoined the larger group, she turns on her as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's but a... All... Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, but also Camille makes a lot of really bad decisions throughout the course of this book. Oh, yeah. So really, really really suspect lack of judgment moments, you know, Uh, the night she goes out and gets high with Emma. Oh, that's such a weird night that and it doesn't really nothing really comes of it. You know, I mean, (sighs) she goes out. She's hammered when she bumps into them and she gets in the car. They end up doing like Oxycontin. Yep. And ecstasy. Yep. <laughs> um, I don't know if there was a third one or not. But I think that was it. Yeah, I think that's it because she gets to the party and they're doing that thing where it's like, well, whenever the ex like melts, whoever mm-hmm. it melts on first, they're playing a game mm-hmm. and the girl like makes sure that it breaks up in Camille's mouth. So that yeah, she yeah. is the one yeah, that's hit with it all. Yeah, okay, and because yeah. uh, then the other guys yell at her. Yeah, because Emma and her friend are roaming around town with like two known drug dealers, you know, with fucked up skin. So like they're clearly on meth. Yeah, like yeah. you can tell. And they the party that they go to, Camille's the oldest by like ten years. Yeah, she has no business being at this weird party. Mm-mm. And then John and Ma- Meredith show up, right? And. They end up having to leave because, you know, everybody thinks John is the murderer. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, Where so did... we've barely even talked about like the main plot of this, That's which is the true. murder. Yeah. Um, but jo- there is one little girl who was killed about a year earlier, and then another girl turns up uh, missing, and they find her body wedged in between a couple of businesses in this like plaza, and she, they both had their teeth removed. Mm-hmm. And it's like the only suspect that they really have is John and like the basis for it. And we find out later that this isn't actually what the, uh, the cop thinks because the FBI agent, I keep calling him a cop, but that's not exactly accurate. Um, but Willis is like claiming that that's who he is, Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. looking into, but it turns out that he was lying to Camille the whole time. Yeah. 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 Which is, um, I mean, he has a pretty lame excuse later on for why he did it. But, um, but yeah, that's a different conversation. And he says that like John's over emotional reaction to his, his sister being killed is evidence Hmm. because, no kid of John's age is going to show himself being that, bur- like, cut up about it. Right. And it's obviously his remorse for having done this. Mm-hmm. And once we find out that Willis is actually suspicious of Adora, he's just saying this about John. I don't even know if he really believes that. I don't think so either. Yeah. I just, I found it interesting that he tried to spin it that way Mm -hmm. you know well the town people sure ate it up Mm -hmm. you know i mean he's the older brother of one of the dead girls and he's not living at home anymore he's moved out to live in like the carriage house or whatever of his girlfriend's family the wheelers right so he's left home because his parents refused to take down any of his sister's belongings and Mm -hmm. natalie's like all everything is still up and he says he can't bear to you know, see her shit everywhere. Right. Yeah. So he leaves, but that makes him look like, you know, it's, it's another sort of negative thing for him. Um, and he his girlfriend, got, Meredith, I was, gonna, I was just about to bring her up. <laughs> oh my God. This girl is a piece of work. Yeah. Like everything is about her mm-hmm. and how I'm supporting John and John's having a really hard time, but I've been there for mm-hmm. him and she gets really angry when Camille interviews the two of them and leaves her name out of it. Yeah. She's the one that sets the interview up because, um, Camille has tried to talk to the family. And mm-hmm. once Mrs. Keene realizes Camille is a reporter, she's like, you get the fuck out of my house. Yep. So Camille needs this interview and the story. And Meredith is the one who sets it up, but she does it out of her own self-serving interests. Like she, mm-hmm has already pictured herself as like the long suffering girlfriend who stands by her man and, you know, is envisioning herself playing this really big role. And when the interview comes out and she's not in it, she is pissed. Oh, she is so mad. And I can't believe how long the conversation goes on. She is shameless about Mm -hmm. the fact that this is meant to be showcasing her. Mm -hmm. And she eventually enters into like negotiations Mm -hmm. for the next interview and what she's saying and what she wants printed. And Camille finally has to put her foot down and be like, I'm in a print when I'm in a print. Yeah. And I'm not post- put, printing that bullshit you started off with yeah. because you rehearsed it. Yeah, there's and- the one line that she, she tries to use. And Camila's like, nobody fucking talks like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's like, mm, that sounds like bull. And I really love that. Actually, there's a quote that I um, I went and found because I like loved it so much. People got such a charge from seeing their names in print. Proof of existence. I could picture a squabble of ghosts ripping through piles of newspapers, pointing at a name on the page. See, there I am. I told you I lived. I mm-hmm. told you I was. I really like that a lot, too. Oh, it's so good. This yeah. woman's writing kills me. <laughs> <sighs> She's so good. Um, and they're like... The, the fact that this is the only option that she really has for somebody that she can get to John... Um, Mm -hmm. it's so frustrating. And then she winds up sleeping with John. Listen, bad fucking, what is she thinking? How old is this kid? He's 18. He tells us earlier, like early in the book. Okay. Well, thank Um, God for that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, because the next morning when the cops show up, 
Willis and Vickery and they mm-hmm. catch them in the hotel room. One of the things he asked them is like, how old are you? Yeah. But um, Camille is so damaged. Yeah, right? she is. The, and these choices that she's making in this book, those are the kind of choices damaged people make. You know, mm-hmm. those are the kind of sabotaging that you do. You know? Yeah. Um, she's, you know, 10 to 15 years <clears throat> older than the kids when she goes to that party and gets high with mm-hmm. her 13 year old sister. She doesn't have a conversation in her head about it, too. Like, you know, I'm right now doing drugs with my 13 year old sister. I'm a terrible piece of shit person. Mm-hmm. Um, and I uh, really love, like, she's watching Ama after the conversation where Ama is saying, like, you let people do things to you and it fucks them up. Ama walks away and she uh, says to herself, 13 years old, I thought to myself, but I felt a spear of admiration for the girl. When I'd been sad, I hurt myself. Ama hurt other people. Hmm. When I'd wanted attention, I'd submitted myself to boys. Do what you want. Just like me. Ama's sexual offerings seemed a form of aggression. Long skinny legs and slim wrists and high babied voice all aimed like a gun. Do what I want. I might like you. Hmm. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. The submission thing. Like, you know, she sleeps with... The the first scene of her and um, Willis hooking up is really uncomfortable and strange. Like, yeah. they're in that truck together, parked near <laughs> where, like, kids go to make out. Mm-hmm. And just, like, grope each other. And then later on they have sex, but she doesn't want him to see the yeah, she scars take, all over her. Yeah, herself. she doesn't take any of her clothes off. He keeps trying to, like, move her shirt or whatever, and she has to keep putting her hand back up. And yeah. Uh, I don't know how you do that. Like, I just can't imagine being able to get away with having sex with somebody and not showing any skin or pulling any clothes off and them not being like, okay, yeah. we need to stop. What is yeah. going on? You know? Yeah. But I guess he's either so caught up in the moment or he's was, just so determined to like keep her in his good graces so that he can like continue to uh, spy on Adora via her. I think it's a testament to, or it's it's calling out that sometimes when you're having sex with someone, the other person really doesn't give a fuck about how you feel about it. They don't really yeah, care true. if you're enjoying it. You know, they just so I'm so he noticed. You know, because he tried to like move her shirt and pull her pants down and stuff, but he didn't give a fuck enough to be like, wait, what's going on with you? Like, what? You know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's probably pretty common, especially when you're talking about sex between practical strangers, you know, at yeah. this point, they've known each other for like three days, It you know, tops. Um, yeah. Yeah. He doesn't care. But it's funny because by the end of the book, we're supposed to believe that he really does have real feelings for her. You know, that he's I in love with see, her. I didn't get that sense. I got more of a sense that he, like, felt protective of her, but not that he, like, had, like, romantic feelings for her. Did oh, I totally, that? I totally did. Um, I might have misread that. A couple times. And there's, um, there's even other characters remark about how he seems taken with her. Like, when she goes to the mm-hmm. hospital towards the end to get the Marion's records, mm-hmm. and the nurse tells her that, you know, the FBI agent has already been here. Right. Um... But after the thing with her getting caught with John in the hotel room, she goes to Willis's house right. and tries to blow him and he stops her, you know, and he's just like, no, it's not, it can't be like that anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, he, and, the, and Richard, she's willing to show his, her scars to, which yeah, I that, found really interesting. I want to say he even there's even a declaration from him at some point in the book about how much he cares about her. Um, okay. But again, yeah. like, I don't know if I'm buying that because he's lying to her the whole time, even though she's mm-hmm. lying to him, too, because everybody in this book is terrible. That's true. Um, yeah. But yeah, it did feel to me like they were trying to make that some sort of. Also, he never talks to her again at the end of this yeah. book. She never mm-hmm. talks to him again, which I just was like, wow. 
that's really fucked up. Yeah. That is, I mean, I can imagine her just wanting to stay the fuck away from him and not letting him talk to her, but it doesn't sound like he even reached out and she rebuffed him. Like, there was just nothing. It sounds like he just never, you know, said another word to her. Um, Uh, Well, go ahead. (laughs) Well, I was just going to say that, like, so we have, um, there is one particular scene between Adora and Camille where Adora is, like, just drunk sitting on the stairs and is like, hey, come and have a drink with your mom. And Camille's like, okay, I guess. And Adora just blurts out, I don't know why I never loved you. Mm -hmm. I tried. And I thought getting close to these other little girls that were like you could maybe get me to understand and like you. Mm. And that was when I started to be like, okay, I do think that either Adora killed them because she couldn't get close to them and she resented that Mm -hmm. or that it was Ama killing them because she was threatened by them yeah which turned out to 100 percent be the thing right yeah which is- there's actually a thread guys if you are in the um, unspoiled book club group where i post that comment I'm like i think sh- i think it's ama killing girls who are threatened by th- that she's threatened by and then the comment right underneath that i'm like or it's the mom or it's the creepiest fuck stepdad i don't know <laughs> everybody's terrible like <laughs> i would be very sure and then be like nah maybe not this um this stepdad to Alan, he oh. is like he is like a ghost in the yeah. story. He's a ghost in their lives. He mm-hmm. the way that he is described, he comes from a very well healed family. Uh he was willing to marry a girl who got knocked up out of wedlock and had a baby. Mm-hmm. And I think it said something like he had been a a world class equestrian. But he gave oh, it up. Yeah, I forgot he about gave it up because Adora was worried about him, you know, worried for his safety. So he stopped doing it. He's never worked. He just walks around the house in his loafers, whistling, drinking lemonade. And bland as bland can be. Right. Oh, man. The one scene that he talks really at all is when he's reprimanding Camille for shit she never did or said. Mm-hmm. Yep. Because just apparently she... her mom's just going around lying. Yep, yep. He tells her, you can't be talking about corpses and dead bodies and what they look like decomposing. She's like, why would I, what? Yeah. <laughs> when did I say any of that? Wondering about how much blood there could have been when their teeth were yanked out. Mm-hmm. And she's like, yeah, that's definitely what I'm wondering about. <laughs> what is wrong with you? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, he, he, there's something about him that's so unsettling to me. Like, and that was part of me being like, uh, is it him? Is it? But I kept thinking like the book doesn't feel like it's going to be one where some, cause that can be a thing in a lot of mysteries is that they'll have a character who like makes an impression on you in the moment, but then you forget about, and they're not super important to what seems to be the main plot. And then it turns out at the end that it's that random that was the mm. murderer the whole time. Mm. And Uh, The more I read, like, initially I suspected him because men are trash and I just expect the man to be the one. But then I started to be like, that doesn't feel like what this book is doing, though. Like, this is a real look at at the relationship between mothers and daughters, the relationship between women with each Mm -hmm. other Mm -hmm. as children and as adults. I don't feel like a man is going to be the one to, like, have committed these crimes. Right. Um, There's also real resistance within the story of the murderer being a woman. Yeah. From like townspeople, from the chief of police, and we'll be we find out later he's lying. But from Willis, from from Richard, you know, mm-hmm. even he is like, No, this doesn't seem like a woman, this is a man, you know, probably a drifter, if not the brother and um And the one thing that keeps coming up as being sort of puzzling to everybody is if it was a man, why aren't these girls raped? Because mm-hmm. there's no evidence of sexual assault of any kind yeah. on the bodies. Yeah. So that's the one thing that people keep coming back to is like you would think, Mm -hmm. but no. And then we find out that the girls had been groomed, right? One girl Mm -hmm. had her legs shaved. Another girl had her fingernails painted, Mm -hmm. which were things that the family says they would never have done when they were alive. You know, these were not little girls who painted their nails or shaved their legs. Um, Yeah. So slowly it begins to become clear um camille starts to like she has that conversation with the family friend what is her name again jackie jackie i want to say janice um 
Don't and forget Jackie. about the lunch before the, she has the one on one with Jackie. Remember, she goes to the fancy restaurant and all the ladies are lunching. It's like five of Adora's friends and they get really drunk. Oh, yeah. And that's the first time Jackie tells Camille that she needs to leave. She needs to get out of Wind Gap. I don't think it's safe for you here. Yeah, and then the other girl, the other woman is like, come on, Jackie, you've had too much to drink. Let me take you to the bathroom and make yourself feel better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Jackie, like, she goes to Jackie kind of sensing because Jackie says that her and Adora are on the outs right now. Mm -hmm. And Camille's sort of like, yeah, I feel like there's more to that than she said. And we find out that Jackie's got the sense that Adora might be behind this and knows what went on with Marion. Mm-hmm. And that basically Adora is cutting her out of her life for suspecting and maybe hinting at it because she's, when she gets drunk, she just says shit. Yeah. So I would guess that she maybe said too much to Adora one time mm-hmm. and basically straight up tells Camille, your mom is messed up. Mm-hmm. Like there, you really need to be get out of here. You need yeah. to go. Like she's dangerous. Yeah. Um, and Jackie tells Camille, she's like, you know, you have to think about it this way. Your mother, you know, was an unwed, practically a teenage mom. You know, she got pregnant when she was 17 in a town like this that should have destroyed her. Mm -hmm. But she managed to be the sympathetic victim and the whole town ended up loving her even more, Mm -hmm. you know, which is quite a feat. Yeah. And I hadn't like when she when you find out that she had had uh Camille out of wedlock, you are just like, Wow, really? Like mm-hmm. I definitely had that reaction. So mm-hmm. yeah. Um and so Camille goes from there to the hospital and gets these records and talks to a nurse who is like, We tried to say Yeah. We she all finds had little, our suspicions. Finds a note in the file. Um mm-hmm. Where the nurse it's signed by it like out. six different nurses, right? Like, I think it's just signed by the one nurse, but she's because the other women were afraid to put their name. But she says, gotcha. she says, like all of us, we all, you know, suspect this is happening because they've been paying attention that, you know, the daughter will seem fine and then the mom will come and visit. And then all of a sudden she's sick again, mm-hmm. um, noticing the mother's behavior around the doctors and kind of mm-hmm. trying to be the center of attention when really it should be the daughter just right. you know and she says to the nurse because because after she reads the file camille finds the nurse and is able to talk to her again about it and she impresses upon her like you have to remember how different it was then you know people didn't take nurses seriously they still really don't take us seriously mm-hmm. um munchausen by proxy was not like on the tip of everybody's tongue the way it is you know now mm-hmm. um and the woman says when she heard Marion die, she drank for three days. Yeah. Like, like that's how guilty she felt that she didn't do enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she says she almost lost her job over what the note in the file. Yeah. Because Marion's or Mar- uh, Adora's family was wealthy. Like they basically employed the entire town. Mm-hmm. They're mm-hmm. people of position and privilege and doctors yep. did not want to hear it. Yeah. And added to the position and privilege you have adora who when you're looking at her she is everything you think that a woman like her should be you know Mm -hmm. she's well mannered she's uh polite she's intelligent she's you know saying all the right words you know what i mean so right the way she carries and presents herself to the world is almost like she's above reproach you know like a woman like adora would never Right. You know, do the kind of things you're talking about. That's a trashy mom. That's a poor mom. That's a, you know what I mean? That's a, that's, mm-hmm. that's not this type of woman. And she, Adora uses that as like, we said earlier, a weapon, but also a shield. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Which I mean, I think is definitely a thing a lot of women learn to do even when they're not murdering their children yeah, i wish i had learned to do it a little bit i'm not gonna fucking lie i don't do it like i think i could be much better at it if, hey, it, if i care to exp- i'm right here your screen just went blank i'll be back okay <laughs> <laughs> it just has a little unspoiled uh, logo 
Uh, um, as long as everybody can still hear me, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> so you um, were saying you think you could be? You I could think do I that could better? have been that kind of woman if I if I felt like it was going to be really necessary and I, and the expenditure of energy was worth it. I could have gone down that road because playing a part is has been something that sort of appealed to me when I was like in my teens and early 20s. Mm. And it's part of why I enjoyed dating so much was that you got to be whoever you wanted with someone who didn't know you very well. Oh, I never and, even thought of it like that. Yeah, I always like kind of tried on different personalities when I would go on a first date or a really? second date and just yeah, it was a very conscious decision. And I think if I had decided that I wanted to be in a position in the world where that was advantageous somehow, I could have really like lent into that a lot more. Um, But I finally like started to really understand who I was and was like, nah, nah, because that stuff appeals to you a lot more when you don't know who you are, I think, Mm -hmm. and you are trying to sort of figure it out and you're experimenting and Luckily, I was brought up by a mom who really emphasized how bullshit, like politeness and what the expectations for being ladylike were. Right. So I rejected a lot of that stuff because of that. And I obviously the way Adora would have been raised, that would be paramount. Mm hmm. So I feel like because of my personality, if I had been raised differently and if I, my career had gone in a different direction, I could have wound up a lot more like her in mm. some ways. And that's very alarming to me at times when I think back on like there is a, a certain amount of like sociopathy, I feel like, that comes into play yeah. when you can just be another person. Mm-hmm. Um And I so I often side eye myself. I think that I have like I have the tendency where I could like be a pretty terrible human being and I just have to watch it at times. Do you know what I mean? Like I really keep an eye on it. And I, I've texted you before and been like, is something wrong with me that I'm reacting this way? Is that not okay? Um, so yeah, I find Adora to be like really compelling because she's just so like, she's so damaged herself mm-hmm. and so vicious, but in this strange circuitous way it's not this direct lashing out the way that alma deals with things it's this internalized like maelstrom of stuff that people get sucked into if they're like around her Mm -hmm. do you know what i mean it's just it's bizarre she is has positioned herself to where she gets to tell everybody what is okay and what's not okay Mm -hmm. and right and she manages to do that while she is simultaneously being like the worst person ever. Yep. But she is able to, you know, reprimand. Every time she sees Camille, I feel like she says something to her either about the way she's dressed or the way she's standing or how she's speaking or what she's talking about. It's like this constant criticism. Yeah. You know, and you know that that's not just leveled at Camille. You know that this is just a door. On a, right. on a Tuesday. Yep. Um, when they go to the funeral after they find the second girl, um, and Camille is trying to take notes, and her mother is just like, you know, that is so tacky, how rude and disrespectful. And you yeah. are embarrassing me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the first you know, thing. No, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry, go ahead. I was huh. going to say, that's one of the first things that Adora tells Camille is that you're, when you're here... You represent me. Right. You know? Yeah. And and we just talked about how like weirdly nothing and somehow by virtue of nothingness being creepy, the stepdad is. And it's uh, that's like, obviously, Adora found a husband that would not take attention away from her mm-hmm. in any way. Mm-hmm. He's background. Yep. And would not embarrass her. In yeah, way. that's he's right. He's respectable and he's nothing. You know, like, like exactly <laughs> what she's looking for in a man. <laughs> um, huh. And he seems content because there's, I mean, there's nothing in the, in this book that suggests that he is doing anything other than hanging around the house. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, he could be out getting 
sloshed or, or sleeping with other women, but I don't think he's doing any of that. I think he's exactly what she tells us he is in this book. Hanging on Adora's every word and yep. uh, command, it yep. sounds like. And um, uh, what was I getting ready to say? The two little girls, we find out, uh, like the one girl, John's sister, Natalie, they had to leave Philadelphia of all places. Right. right? Because she had this, this incident where she, she took a girl's eye out with a pair of scissors. Almost so, both. Almost the both. The other one they could save, but mm-hmm. whoa. And it's, what does the family say? John says that it was blown out of proportion, right? That she, mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't think it was that it was an accident. No, but was, he says that I think that she was being picked on and that she finally like, like lost it. Something. Because, and, but it was like, yeah. Right. And she gets, she doesn't, she gets off. Oh my God. There's got to be a better way to say that. <laughs> she doesn't, you know, get in trouble or serve any time for that. And, and her family ends up paying the little girl's family like this huge settlement. Yeah. And then what was the story with the other little girl? The other little girl was a biter. Right. Yeah. I can't remember what wound up, what it was specifically that went down with her. There was, um, Um, but they were both girls who like fought back and got a little violent as they needed to be. The Wheeler girl who died, was it the Wheeler girl who died? No, wait, wait, wait. Meredith tells a story about being bitten. Meredith, Meredith is the one who tells Camille that one of the little girls who died bit her. Right. But I can't remember who the little girl was and why Meredith was with her. Maybe she was babysitting? I can't remember. I'm trying to find in this, like, summary if that's something that's uh, mentioned, but no. Because then there's this whole thought process of maybe that's what the teeth pulling was about. Right. But that turned out to, you know, be about be a something bit of a completely, red herring. completely different. That turned yeah. out to be about flooring. <laughs> yeah. So, That's... all right. To to move along with the actual plot, once Camille starts to realize like, that it was likely her mother who killed Marion, she goes home and is basically like, all right, poison me, bitch. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a weird combo of things that are going on, actually, because she confronts Willis about the fact that he has been suspecting her mom clearly mm-hmm. in line to her. And he's like, well, you like that is all true. And you would have been really good evidence if you were ill. And she's like, oh, cool. Thanks for giving a shit about mm-hmm. my actual mm-hmm. well-being. So she goes back and then there's like a combo of poison me so I can be evidence. But also, if I let you poison me, you will care about me. Mm. Like she is weirdly embracing the only experience that she's ever going to have Mm -hmm. of her mother seeming to care about yeah she says even though it is not about her at all you know even though she's sick and she knows that her mother has done it there's a moment where she's got like her head in her mother's lap and her mother is caressing her head and you know stroking her hair and Camille, and it's happening, I think, in the mother's big bedroom that Camille has always never been allowed in. Yeah. And there's this moment where she is like, this is everything I've always wanted, you know? I just yep. had to let her make me sick in order to get it. Yep. And she also, doesn't Camille start thinking to herself a little bit, like, why couldn't I have just been, like, why was this so hard for me when I was mm-hmm. a kid, you know? Almost yeah. like she's... Camille is wondering what's wrong with me. Why could I let my mother have this? You know, Mm -hmm. which is really fucked up because there's nothing wrong with you and you shouldn't want to let yourself be poisoned. It's like the whole. And it goes on a long time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like four days, three or four days. I just like and like reading it seems like forever. Yeah, you know, like she's just getting like like between, her mother is putting her in the bath and bathing her and whew, it's yeah. intense. And the the she I I can't find where it is, but she says something um, later about how for people who only got cared about when they were sick, hurt becomes comfort. Mm-hmm. So that's part of like her cutting herself and tending to her wounds really carefully is her giving herself 
some comfort Mm -hmm. in this way that like is one of the only ways that she understands receiving that kind of of care and attention right and love care pain is love you know Mm -hmm. and that is one of like the most heartbreaking things in the book like her coming to that realization and, and like finally like really seeing it because she never you know she went and was hospitalized and went to all kinds of therapists and stuff about her cutting but she didn't have a basis for understanding it because she didn't know what her mother was doing or at least didn't have the courage to really look at it right right she until definitely this didn't. happened yeah which, so now that she realizes like what was going on, she can understand better where she was coming from doing this stuff to herself. Mm-hmm. It's a revelation. Basically. Like, yeah. Like things start to make sense, you know, mm-hmm. um, I do, I will say I find it interesting that she's had so much therapy, spent so much time under a doctor's care and these, these suspicions and things about her mother or maybe what happened with Marion never came out. Yeah. But I guess something like that could be buried so deep and just something you don't want to face. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I imagine if you're a cutter to the extent that she was, it would be very easy to make that the focus of therapy, you know, Mm -hmm. because she says early, you know, about how she spent thousands of hours in therapy and no one could tell her why, you know. Right. Um, Oh, here it is. Alma enjoyed hurting. I like violence. A child weaned on poison considers harm a comfort. Mm. So that, that sentence, when I, I was just like, good God, this book. That was like <laughs> one of those moments for me. Mm. So there's also a, a little thing that happens in the book where Camille meets that little boy, James Capizzi, and he tells the story about seeing Natalie get snatched that they had been playing ball. Right. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. And, um, he says a woman all dressed in white with a white face just comes and grabs her and takes her into the woods. Mm-hmm. And, um, that was another moment where I was like, okay, that's gotta be Amma. Right. <laughs> right. Like I, at first I'm like, was that the mom? And then I'm like, he would recognize, like, obviously this is somebody in disguise or something, but like, I couldn't make yeah. heads or tails of it for a little while. Yeah. And, uh, then I went like, I was like, it's gotta be Ama. And then I was like, well, no, he would, like you said, I was like, he would know Ama though. Right. Wouldn't he know mm-hmm. who she is? So then I was like, okay, well, a door, maybe he wouldn't recognize a door. And he tells, he tells Camille that's an older woman and she tries to figure out what age. And he says like a mom's age. But uh, we find out later that Ama is the one who has taken the girls. But Willis says, what does he say? He says he doesn't think that James saw that exactly. Ah, I f- but somehow I forget what Willis says. He says basically that somehow James has like taken whatever it is he did see and mm-hmm. it got like all confused in his head. With, that he basically like it was a you know the a uh, terrifying woman that he turned into this horror mm-hmm. of like you know a mysterious woman all in white and mm-hmm. her skin was white and her right. hair was white and he like basically it was a frightening moment that he turned into an actual monster in right, a way right right yeah and uh, we find out later that it was Alma and that she had done the thing where she wrapped herself in sheets mm-hmm. and had uh like powdered her face white. And told Natalie that they were playing a game and to come with us into the woods. Mm-hmm. But, um, uh, yeah. Even that was, like, we only met this kid for a minute, but it sounded like his mom is dying of cancer. He's seen this thing, this trauma, this traumatizing thing. He's a witness to somebody being snatched who later showed up dead. And it's mm-hmm. just this town is relentless. You know? There's yeah. just... Ah, uh, there's just... It's just a... A sad, twisted, <laughs> toxic little town. <laughs> uh. So the cops, like, back to uh, Camille letting her mom poison her. The cops bust in. 
They find her. They test her blood. She's got all kinds of crazy toxins in her all system. Kinds of shit. All, all kinds of shit. All of which shit. they connect to all of these pills that are in her mother's like. Mm-hmm. And they're all like illegal, like taken off the market shit. Mm-hmm. That's like you have to send away for mail order mm-hmm. service to like Africa to get half of them. Or yeah, Russia. they're like medications that had such terrible side effects that they were taking off. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And so they find all this. They find the pliers in her room. That have blood on them and that match the marks on the girl's teeth or mouths since they could never find the teeth. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they assume that it was the mother and lock her up and she does not protest, which I find interesting. She doesn't right? say like, we don't ever hear her say I didn't kill those little girls. Nope. Which makes me think that she knew what Amma was doing. I suspect the same thing. Yeah. That, um, I mean, we don't follow her trial or anything, but, but there's, it's not in the book that she denied anything and she gets out on bail you know she's yeah. got, she can afford it so i 100 percent believe that she knows it's ama yeah and then eventually as camille tries to continue life and care for ama herself and help ama and herself recover from what they have she's realizing they both have gone through she becomes friendly with one of ama's friends mm-hmm. and she grows to really like this girl and one day Alma questions her about like well do you like her better than me and the very like next day the girl turns up dead with not all her teeth missing Mm -hmm. some of them missing Mm -hmm. and at this point the police have a bead on Adora and know that she is not possible like she's not a possible suspect for this the first thing Camille does is call to make sure her mom is still fucking locked up (laughs) yep and so she realizes that it was Ama and knows that the teeth have to be somewhere and mm. begins to tear the house apart looking for them. And I kind of wondered if Ama wasn't just going to like break down and tell her, but she doesn't. Finally, Camille goes through this dollhouse, which has been something that kept coming up throughout the book. It sure did. Ama's weird obsession with making sure the house is exactly a replica yep. of the house she grew up in. Yep. And that, that was one of the first things that sets me off. Like, what's that? That tantrum she has early in the book. Yeah. That was one of the first things that I was like, all right, something's up with this girl. Like, initially, Camille coming across her with her friends set apart from everyone else, set off my alarm bells right away. But then I sort of set that aside and was like, well, maybe that's just an interesting setup for her, like, coming into this town. Mm-hmm. And then when she has that tantrum, I was like, all right, no, no, something's <laughs> up. But it turns out that what Amo uh, did was she killed girls who threatened her. And then she took their teeth to use as the flooring Mm -hmm. in the replica of her mother's bedroom. Because her mother has this famous ivory tiled floor that was in like a bunch of different magazines and stuff. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to exactly replicate it. And so she stole these dead girls' teeth to use Mm -hmm. in the Mm -hmm. house. Mm -hmm. Good Lord. And the girl, the last girl that she killed, she mentions how the little girl's hair is exactly the color of the carpet in Camille's room. And when Camille looks in the replica of her room in the dollhouse, there is a woven rug made out of the girl's hair on the floor. (laughs) Wow, guys. Wow. You should have seen. I was walking into my hip hop cardio class with my headphones on listening to the scene of her pulling the house apart looking for these things and everybody's like starting to like get focused and the music starts playing and i'm list i'm stock still in the back of the classroom like this (laughs) just and then when she's like and the floor made out of human teeth and i just went fucking knew it like all like and everybody is like i'm like like take my headphones out. I had to stop listening at that exact moment. And it was killing me that I like finally reached it and I had to take my headphones out and I didn't get to like listen to the rest of it. But oh my God. Yeah. What a reveal. Yeah. What a reveal. Oh, it's messed up. <laughs> oh, <sighs> this book was so fucking good. I'm glad you liked it. Was it was so good though. I'm glad you liked it. Yeah. And I know that a lot of people had an issue with, like, in Gone Girl, uh, to spoil Gone Girl for those who, you know, are 
<laughs> who have not followed along with all of the book club books real quick. Um, but there is a POV from a husband who is suspected of murder. And a lot of people get irritated about the fact that you're in his POV and he never thinks to himself, I definitely didn't do it or I definitely did it. That even like if you were being accused, you would have the thought that you were innocent. Mm -hmm. But apparently he never actually thinks that in the text and people like got really irritated by that, which I get, but I accept it as like a, it's a conceit of the story, mm -hmm. you know, that we're going to, you know, it's fine. Um, and the way that this book, it's, it's all from Camille's point of view. And it's like, despite the fact that she doesn't know exactly what's going on, she still suspects enough that you and I both picked up mm -hmm. on the same thing. I find that to be like, just, it's just so interesting to me th that I wonder how many other people had the same experience, you know, people who are listening to this. Oh. If you read this and you had no idea at all throughout or if you did have the same thing happen as me and Rashawn, where we both were like, mm, this mother killed that little girl. Like, tell us, because I'm curious to hear about the different experiences people had. Right. They, um, over the summer, you know, HBO had the limited series of this. Um, right. I only watched the first two episodes. I had a lot of trouble with the pacing of it. Uh, um, yeah, I've heard that from a couple people that it was so slow that they couldn't deal yeah, with it. Yeah, but which I wish was a bummer because I thought the book was just like, like I, like we both said at the beginning, once I started, I could not stop reading it. And mm -hmm. I don't know what kind of choices were made, but that didn't happen for me with the HBO series, though I did hear from people who stuck it out that it was pretty good at the end. Like, you know, it finally mm -hmm. found its feet. So I'm thinking about going back. And giving it another try after I listened to it this time. Because I was like, God damn, that is a really good fucking story. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, I just... I The the theme of violence among women mm -hmm. and the different types of... Mm -hmm. That it can, you know... I mean, there and there's so many descriptions of Ama doing things that are really messed up. Like, there she corners Natalie before ever killing her. They cut her hair off. Mm-hmm. Or there are some girls that, like, make this other little girl, like, show her private parts and let the, to the boys. And let the boys put, like, a stick up to her or something. Yeah. There's the scene where Camille follows Ama to the pig farm and she goes by herself. Oh, that was the part that cemented for me that she was a psycho. Like, the the tantrum was when I was like, something's up with this girl. And then that scene, I was like, nope, she is psychotic. There's something wrong. Like, desperately wrong. Yeah. But yeah, the pig farm scene, like the description of everything is so horrifying. It just, I wish so much that I could just buy like free range meats and stuff. I've tried to be vegetarian and that shit did not work out at all. <laughs> I can't do it. I did it for like two years and it was not good for me. But I know this is the reality. I know this is what it's like. Mm -hmm. It's just awful, you know. Nobody wants to know how um, the sausage is made. It's true though. Mm -hmm. I really don't want to know. <laughs> And yeah, her her bullying of all of these girls in these really specific and horrifying ways. Mm -hmm. And the other girls helped Ama kill them. Yeah, that's the... Yeah. These, yeah. like... And apparently, one of them was having such, like, pangs of guilt that they were all meeting and considering whether they were going to have to kill her as well. Mm -hmm. Jonna? Joanna? Oh, maybe... What was her Jodes. name? Jodes, that's yeah. it, yeah. And she was like the lowest on the totem pole when the when the group was interacting. Anyway, she was constantly being berated and humiliated. Mm -hmm. um, it's a wonder that she was even allowed to hang out with them, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a point where like Camille comes in and chats with all of them and then leaves, and I think it's Ama who's like, "Yeah, why don't you take Jodes with you?" <laughs> and Camille's leaving and thinking to herself, "Wow, Jodes is not long for yeah. this whole group." There's she a, didn't know like how literal that was when she said right. it, but when they go to the yeah. party and Emma decides she wants to hang out with Camille and the other little girls, you know, she basically dismisses them. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, for a moment they're just like they don't know what to do if she's not around yeah. to you know be the boss of them. Mm -hmm. uh, the dynamics amongst. With all of us, but women and little girls, man, that shit is, that shit can be really ugly 
you know. Yeah. Um, and all you have to do is have one that has that strong personality that's going to be a leader and mm-hmm. find the right ones that will follow behind. And it's just, mm-hmm. it's, it's a recipe for disaster almost every time. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like this stuff, like, you know, we talk about Mean Girls and, like, that movie being really comical and amusing and this, like, but I like the fact that these are younger. They're not high school age girls Mm -hmm. where you start to, like, understand the consequences of things a little bit more. And I feel like high school, this stuff doesn't happen the same way. It is, like, middle school or maybe freshman year of high school, but I feel like, like, 13, you're still, like, at eighth grade, right? Mm -hmm. That is when I saw the most cruelty among kids yep. that I was in school with. Middle it was school, awful. vicious, vicious. Yeah. Um, oh my God. Yeah. And a lot of people, that's very common. Um, and the fact that it's sexualized the way it is, even among them, when it isn't really treated that way, when it's with boys, like it's, it's like the, I just feel like the patriarchy teaches women so from so young that their worth is directly attached to their sex appeal but also their virginity there's a line in the book i forget who says it it may be jackie maybe somebody else and they say if the boys like you then the girls will like you Hmm. um i think it's jackie talking about either ama or adora saying that Mm -hmm. you know um, and it, and that's true. I mean, they can kind of go the other way out of jealousy, but but even if the girls don't like you for real, they'll leave you alone. The boys like they'll admire you enough. Exactly. To, yeah. Exactly. If the boys like you, that will put you up above because that is supposed to be what we are here for, right? Women are here mm-hmm. for boys to like us or not like us, and we want them to like us. That's better. Mm-hmm. And I just, I remember reading that and being like, God damn, that is fucking true as shit. Yep. Yeah, so the, that that sexualized, like, targeting when it came to bullying and, like, forcing girls to, like, expose themselves mm-hmm. and, like, just doing things that would humiliate them in that specific type of way just shows that you don't have to be very old to understand that dynamic mm-hmm. and and weaponize that in a way that's really upsetting that it happens that young yep. you know but it, it's just you know there are so many people that roll their eyes at the talk of like rape culture but if kids are doing this sort of thing to each other which they are it's because they understand the power that it has to make or break somebody mm-hmm. socially mm-hmm. and that's because they, it's real exactly you know so yeah this book was a lot <laughs> It was a lot. <laughs> like, yeah, a lot. Um, really fascinating. It's the sort of thing that, like, I would like to reread it, but I'm also going to, like, give myself years of distance before <laughs> I do that because I can't handle it right now. Um, but I do kind of want to come back to it, and I'm going to recommend it to, like, everybody because it's just, yeah. it's really When I first read. read it, I was, like, telling people, like, oh, my God, have you read this book yet? Like, has anybody else read this I remember this book? you telling me, Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was part of why I, I um, was excited to see like a bunch of people suggest it because you had mentioned how much you loved it, and I trust your opinion. Oh, so, um, so all right. Well, is there anything you want to add before we wrap it? No, up? no. I'm glad that um was able to do this with you. I'm glad that uh, I'm. I'm sorry. You know, I know that you had a scheduled co-host. I'm not sure what you know, but uh, I was happy. Oh, not for this one. No, no, I didn't have anybody yet. Oh, so you you popped up and like um I think Jamie had said that she might be able to, but she tagged you. Oh, you and lost she was the like, didn't You want to cover this? You co- yeah you. Co- Are you lost? Coming. <laughs> we keep cutting each other off. Oh <laughs> for, for an upcoming <laughs> upcoming one, you lost the co-host. Yeah, you filled in for The Witcher because I did lose um the person who was going to do that one with me. I think, and then. The next one coming up for the childhood favorites, Rachel, who um, co-hosted the previous one, Bridge to Terabithia, was going to do that one. But unfortunately, uh, her mother is not doing well and looks like she's going to be passing away soon. And she oh. just can't. Oh, no. And I just everybody's thoughts with Rachel, please. If yeah. You get a chance. Like, 
Um, she's just dealing with a whole lot, and it sounds like uh, it's going to be really tough for her for a while. Oh, so that's awful. Yeah. So she messaged me. I was like, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to, I was like, please don't be sorry. It's fine. Mm. Yeah. No, but my book club is, will survive. <laughs> you need to go take care of your shit. <laughs> um, so yeah, everybody, uh, thoughts to her, please. If you, if you do prayers, do the prayers also <laughs> thoughts and or prayers. <laughs> um, that sounds so flippant, but it I know. Mean, <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, yeah, as I, uh, I'm going to be doing for the childhood favorite this month is my one of my very favorites ever, which is The Enchanted Castle by Edith Nesbitt. It's free on Kindle. So uh, if you are ever held back from reading something because you don't want to buy it, it's zero dollars. And I'm going to be with Candace for that one. And I'm pretty excited about it because Candace if if she likes something, she really likes it. And if she doesn't, it's trash to her forever. <laughs> so I'll be very interested to see how she reacts to this book and if she likes it or not. Um, so, yeah, that'll be in two weeks. So uh, stay tuned for that. All right. I love you guys. Thanks for listening. Till next time. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Bye, guys. <laughs> Spoiled Network Podcast.